All right, everyone. Thank you for joining. Moshiach decoded. Moshiach the process. Class three. Titled the big ideas. Very exciting class. Um, there's so much. I hope we can get through at least most of it. Um, I want to thank the Werdiger family from Melbourne, Australia, for their grant for this particular series. Shem should bench them. A lot, a lot of bracha. You can give it over personally. Okay. So last week and the week before, we have developed the idea that uh, Golos is not just a punishment, even though we can't ignore the idea that Mipnei Chateinu Galinu Maritzenu, but that's one level of exile, and there's a much deeper level of exile, which has to do with the, the repairing of all of creation and of the entire world, uncovering its godly essence, at the core of all, at the core of creation, and uh, preparing the world for ultimate enlightenment, enlightenment from within and enlightenment from above. That means that the nature of existence should crack open, and the inner spark that it's the core of all of creation should reveal itself. So we become intrinsically aware of God, intrinsically connected to our Creator, and another. And in addition to that, as a result of the channeling of holiness into the world from all of our Torah and our mitzvahs that we've done, will bring about the most magnificent appreciation and understanding and revelation of Hashem, not only of Hashem's light, but of Hashem's essence. And whatever we're talking about in the last few classes, for a more thorough understanding, you listen to the Mashiach Coded classes, the other series where we dis discussed what's the concept of Mashiach. So they complement a lot what we've discussed in the last two classes. In last class in particular, I've shown you a timeline that this tikkun olam, this, this preparation, this rectification of the world, this purification process, uh, even though at any moment if the Jewish people would have done a spectacular tshuva, Even though, even though if the Jewish people would have done an, a, a, even though the Jewish people, if they would have done a spectacular tshuva, we could have made Mashiach come at any moment, um, that would have taken something extraordinary. Uh, and according to the system that Hashem has initially set up from, the, from, the, from, the, from before time has begun, this process is a process that unfolds it's a process that unfolds through time. And Be'ikr, as the sages tell us, we're gonna, we used, this is very important, we used two things to develop the outline. Number one, what the sages tell us, that, there's 2, 000, that the world is 6,000 years, and there's 2,000 years of toyu of chaos, 2,000 years of Torah, and 2,000 years of Yemaisa Mashiach, of the days of Mashiach. That's number one, which gives us a very, very general outlook at how, 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 what the process is. First it's chaos, which means you have a world that doesn't have any design or any purpose sensed in it, and you don't even have any reason for humans to exist other than people eating and drinking and living here. There's nothing ha happening here. At the end of the first 2,000 years, Avram Avinu comes and begins, you can start seeing a creation with some direction, with some purpose. And Torah comes to the world. And then and after the, the year 2000, into the year 3000 is where you have that, that process begins, and it's general for the next 2,000 years. It has been estimated already in the Talmud, in the Gemara, that the process of purification of the world can't even in any way be completed before we have 2,000 years at digging into the husk, into the klipa of the creation, to, to be able to soften the world for its godly light to be able to come out. And the Gemara says the last 2,000 years is Yom Yisam Mashiach, which means that you have already the potential after 2,000 years of, 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 of Torah in the world, of light in the world, you have the potential already for the Moshiach revelation. But ast astounding is that it's almost at the end of that 2,000 year period, and we don't yet have the full-blown 
ex- Mashiach yet fully revealed. But what we do have is an unbelievable thread that we can see growing stronger and stronger and stronger through the 2,000 years as Mashiach starts becoming more evident and more real in the world. That was one system, or rather, that was a very, very, very broad outline. A more specific outline that we spoke about last week is the six days. In other words, instead of breaking it down into sets, three sets of 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, which is what the Talmud says, but as, again, part of the Mashiach process, is that it's, it, it, it would be analogous to when you build a structure. So if you're going down the street and you see them digging a, a, a big, big hole on any, on any main street over here, on Wilshire Boulevard, on La Brea, you have no idea what this is, what, what exactly, you know it's going to be a building because they're not building a farm over here or something. So you know they're building a building, but that's about it. But as you're getting further and further, as they're getting closer to the completion of the structure, then you have an appreciation of this is a store complex, a mall, this is going to be a, 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 a residential uh, uh, place, whatever it is, because you get an idea as you're getting closer, you're narrowing in, it becomes clearer. Same is with, with creation. This construction, it's, the, 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 cr- the world is a world, is, is a project of construction. We're in the midst of building something. We're building a home for Hashem. And that constructive pro- process, the closer you get to the end, the more you start appreciating the design and what it is all about and what is the intended end goal. So therefore you have from Ramban, who we're going to talk about soon in a couple of minutes, the significance of Narmoshe ben Nachman, Nachmanides, in this whole process. But the Ramban revealed to us, and as we discussed last week, that there is six days of creation where every day is a thousand years, and that when we look at that, we can really, really outline the Mashiach process in the world and see where things are heading and what is occurring in each millennia as it, as it moves. So last time we spoke that the Iker Zman for Bias HaMashiach, or when we say Bias HaMashiach, doesn't necessarily mean for Mashiach actually fully coming, but it means for the for the Mashiach process, the Messianic process, to have reached another milestone. Its main, main times are in Elif Hashishi, in the sixth millennium, which is from the year 5000 to the year 6000. Mashiach's time to come, as we brought from the Zohar last week and from many other sources, is not in the year 6000. That's, that's, he missed, there's no reason to come anymore. It's not, 6000 is nothing. The idea is that Mashiach's objective is to come on Friday to prepare the world for its ultimate elevation in the sixth millennium. He must come on Friday. That's his time. Friday, he could have come any time on Friday, but again, it's a preparation for Shabbos, just like we have Shabbos, which is a time of closeness to Hashem, a time of delight, a time of pleasure, a time that we stop all of our work and we can enjoy what is. We don't have to create anything. Same as when Mashiach will come. That's, and then after Mashiach, the seventh millennium is the perfect world, the perfect godly existence, which is the achievements, the culmination of the achievements of all of mankind, especially the culmination of the achievements of the Jewish people. Um, but the, 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 the um, which is going to be, but the time for Mashiach to come, this is an Elif Hashishi in the sixth millennium, and primarily, we said, as Friday, as the Friday, as the clock ticks on throughout Friday, we're getting further and further into Friday. Friday noontime, Chatzos, is when things reach a whole, a whole new level in terms of, in terms of preparation, in terms of the world entering the Mashiach zone. Okay, that was what we what we had discussed in in last week's class. What I would like to do today is to is to like go back to that timeline and start seeing where we have this, what happened in these particular times where you can see Mashiach becoming more of a reality in the world in that particular time. Now, in order to, in order to identify a Mashiach achievement, in order to identify the Messianic power unfolding in the world, what are the identification marks? What are we looking for? What are we looking for? So there are two very, very important things. We have to know what is the end goal. The end goal, Rambam tells us, Maimonides, and again, I'm just quoting Rambam, but there's so many, many, many others, that Ba'isa Zman, the Rambam tells us in the end of his chapter of Kings, the Rambam tells Ba'isa Zman, at that time, there won't be any hunger, there won't be the last halachas of Rambam. 
then Rambam says, Lo ye'esa kol olam kula el ladas Hashem bulvad. That the, that the period of, the, of Mashiach is a time when the entire world will be busy with one thing and one thing only, to know Hashem. And as the Pasuk actually says in the Prophets, we say, Yomala aretz deyas Hashem, that the world will be filled with knowledge of God. So it makes sense that if the end goal is a, the entire, all of humanity be enlightened with the knowledge of Hashem, and the knowledge of Hashem is coming from where? And the knowledge of Hashem is coming from where? It's coming from the Torah. So we understand that the, that the tremendous increased knowledge of knowledge of God, knowledge of Hashem at the end of days, and we're, our process towards it will mean that an increased knowledge in Torah. When we say an increased knowledge in Torah, we don't mean just another, what we call a pshetel, another uh, argument and discourse uh, and, 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 and understanding of uh, halacha and Baba Kama in, in the concepts of in, in, in the laws in, in, in Masechta's Baba Kama or this Masechta and that Masechta. So we're talking about. We're talking about the Pneumius of Torah, the inner light of Torah, which is Yediya Hashem, which is the knowledge of God. Because we know that the Torah has two parts to it. There's the outer part of the Torah, which is what purifies the world, is the inner part of the Torah is an expression of God. So the, 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 the process, the messianic process of coming to Mashiach means it means that there is more revelation of Yediya Hashem, of knowledge of God in the world. And here's where we see Taka, an amazing, amazing thing. When we look at the Torah, we see that even though on the one hand there is a certain system that's called Yerida Sadoros, which means the descent of the generations, and that the earlier scholars and the earlier generations were far, far, far greater minds, and they had a far much greater, sharper understanding of the Torah. You see that in everything. You see that the Jerusalem Talmud is considered a much clearer and higher way of learning than the Talmud Bavli, which was made 100 years later. The fact that, two things, the fact that it was 100 years later, or 150 years later, something like that, already diminished the quality of the, of the Talmud. Also that the fact that it wasn't in Eretz Yisrael, it wasn't Golos, but Machashach and Meshivani, also diminished its, its, and so forth. We know, that we, 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 in, in Judaism, we know that the earlier the rabbis were, you can't argue on them. Later generations can't dispute what was in the earlier generations. So what we, what we consider with awe, tremendous, when something is stated by one of the Rishonim, the earlier generations, which kind of leads till around the, 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 the expulsion of Spain and a little bit after that, when that era stopped, was over. And we go to the era of the Acharonim. So the Acharonim are considered much of lesser power, lesser, lesser authority than the Rishonim, and so on and so forth. So you have this process of Yerida Sadeiris, but at the same time, you have, on another level, in terms of the esoteric and inner light and secret of the Torah, you have a dafka, an increase of that knowledge and of that, and of that understanding, the later and the further, it's almost like two lights to the Jewish people, like the Maral writes. There's a light, it's like a, he says the Gullus is like a tunnel. So when you go into a tunnel, you ever go into the Battery Tunnel in New York or the Lincoln Tunnel, and you're, you're, you're going, you see, you have light coming in at the beginning of the tunnel, you have light coming in at the end of the tunnel. So the light coming in from the beginning of the tunnel is from Har Sinai, that's the Torah that we, but then there's light coming in from the end of the tunnel, that's the incredible revelations that are gonna come from the days of Mashiach. And here's where we're seeing that the further we're going into exile, the darker in a sense it's getting the exile and further and further and further, the more light is coming in and we're getting a brighter light in terms of the revelation of what we call the Pneumius Satora, of the inner element of Torah. So that's one thing that we have to examine, we have to look. Another thing that we need to realize is that the Mashiach process in the world is not just a process that happens as a result of our mitzvahs, which of course it does, but that there is a, there is a particular power that drives that process. Meaning it's not, so when we think about Mashiach, and we say Mashiach is when the world is finally ready, then Hashem reveals himself, like the Chassam Sofer says, to a certain individual, and chooses this indiv individual and he sends him to redeem the Jewish people. So this is like something that happens. So Mashiach, what's Mashiach's role? Mashiach's role is when, when, when we're ready, when, when the world is finally ready, so then you need the agent who like is Hashem's messenger at that time. It's not that, that's not the way it works. The Mashiach process is driven by Mashiach. 
That means that Moshiach exists throughout this entire process. And this is hinted to what the sages say that the moment the Beis Amigdash was destroyed, Moshiach was born. So last week in our class, in the earlier classes, I said, because just in case the Jewish people do tshuva, we have to be able to have Mashiach ready to redeem them. There's something much deeper to that. Even if the Jewish people, even if Hashem, I mean, you can't know this because Hashem gave Bechira, but in concept, even if, even if we're for sure that Mashiach could come, we still needed to have the power of Mashiach in the world. There's no giula without a goel. And the goel is not only the person who finalizes the giula, but the goel is a consistent power of redemption and a power of Moshiach um, drive throughout all of history that drives the redemption. So what we have to look for in terms of these times of history is we have to look for such a figure that is more than just a rabbi, someone that's more than just an ordinary scholar, but someone that exhibits Moshiach qualities which means certain type of leadership that is very unique. And what is that? So if you remember, and this is going back to the first series of classes which we discussed, we discussed the concept of Malchus, of kingship. We also discussed the concept of the uniqueness of Malchus based David, of the kingship, the royalty, the family, the royal family of David and Melech. At that time we had discussed, so at that time we had discussed that the, the, the quality of kingship was the quality of kingship. And then the, the Rambam says that um, even though there were kings, different kings, even though there were different, different kings, various different kings, but once David was Nimshach Lamelech, once David was appointed to be a king, he was Zeicha Bekeser Malchus. He was Zeicha with the crown of kingship for him and his children forever and ever. And even if the Ramam says there will be other kings, like you see later there was a split and there were other kings, their kingship, their rulership is only temporary. In the end it's going gonna, it's gonna to end, it's not going to last forever. Because his kingship is going to last, only David HaMelech is eternal, it's permanent, it's forever and ever, and it's never ever going to cease. And eventually Hashem promises David HaMelech it will come back. We discussed this at great length. But if you remember the main Nakud and the main point, just for what's necessary right now, is that when we say the Dabla the Melech was Zeicha Bekeser Malchus, it means a certain quality of soul. The idea of a king in this sense is someone who, number one, takes an enormous interest, not just an interest, but is completely devoted with his entire being. He is the shepherd of the Jewish people. He cares about them unparalleled to any other care. Similar to what Moshe Rabbeinu was chosen to be in a sense a king, when Hashem saw Moshe Rabbeinu running after that sheep, Hashem says, you're the one. You need someone who's giving his everything, beyond his everything, his life, his entire existence for the Jewish people. And he takes the achrayas, that's number one, he exhibits that, that character trait. But on another hand, that person also has to be someone who has it within him, a certain elevation, a certain exaltedness, something that's very transcendent, something that's almost myst mystique, it's mysterious. You don't know what it is, but there's something very attractive about him. It's more than a, just a charisma. It's, it's a charisma plus, plus, plus. He has this Rayma Musa Nefesh, the exaltedness. And if you remember, we discussed then, it's not just a Rayma Musa Nefesh in terms of human quality. It's because enclosed, a little more mystical, enclosed in his neshama is Hashem's attribute of kingship. It's God's royalty that is enclosed in this person's soul, which gives him almost this magical power of, of, of elatedness. And when you see him, you see that you're dealing with a person that is above, above, above. What does that do to the people? The people joyfully, when I say the people, means the people who recognize who he is, joyfully and with their entire love and passion and that devote themselves completely to his, to his ideals, to his dream, to actualize what he, what, he, what, he, what he stands for, what he's believing in. That's the nature of a king. And we said that David HaMelech acquired this trait and it became in part of his DNA. That means that it goes through his children. Now in the generations we discussed then, the Abraham promises that even if this is going to be, even if your kingship is going to be broken, even if it's going to fall, it's never going to be broken completely. 
Meaning to say that the, throughout the exile, there is a thin, thin, thin um, chain of Malchus based David that never ever ceases, that goes through Jewish history, where you can identify certain, and a certain generations you don't mamish see what, who it is and what it is, but they carry David Amelech's blood, but then at certain times, it starts becoming more and more apparent who these people are that have Moshiach's, David Amelech's kingship in their blood, have this royalty, and that people, and you see in them two things, you see that they, they, they do things, not just for a certain community, but for all of the Jewish people, Again, we're talking about a king of Melech Yisrael, of all the Jewish people. So they on their end are devoted to the Jewish people as a whole. Also you see in them this hisnasus, this exaltedness. Another very interesting thing about this, you have to see in them tremendous humility, because in order for them to be enclosed with God's, with the Abish, this kingship, they have to be battled to Hashem completely, like we discussed in those earlier classes, completely nullified to God, which means they have two opposites in them. They are the most humble of humble that's possible, and at the same time, they are the most exalted and royal that you can. So the highest of the high and the lowest of the low. It's like it's a certain power that's magnificent. And we have to watch throughout history where these people appear. And let's see if we find, particularly in these ages, at the times that we spoke about in this time frame. So the first thing we had mentioned was, no, I just want to be, before, before we go through the time frame, I just want to say, this concept that there is a Mashiach bechol doir v'doir, that there's a Mashiach in every generation, just a couple of, of pointers on that. Where do we take this concept? Where do we see this concept? So I mentioned to you already what the Rishalmi says that when Mashiach, when the Beis Hamidus was destroyed, Mashiach was born. Then we also have the Gemara, the Talmud, the Masech the Sanhedrin, the Gemara speaks about who Mashiach is. And the Gemara says, uh, Rabbi Yechana, the ad, Gemara asks, what's his name? And the Gemara says, Rabbi Shila Amar Shila Shemoy, that Mashiach's name is, Sh- is Shila. Um, and they bring a Pasuk. Rabbi Yanai says, Yinoin Shemoy. Um, Rabbi Hanina says, Hanina Shemoy. Not Rabbi Hanina, the, 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 the yeshiva of Hanina said, Hanina Shemoy. And so on and so forth. And then um, the Gemara says, Amarav Imen Chaya, if he's from the living, who could go on Rabbeinu HaKadosh, he's from Rabbeinu HaKadosh, who at that time was alive. Rabbeinu HaKadosh, Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi, direct descendant of Hillel, direct descendant of David HaMelech, from the dynasty of David HaMelech. And then so on and so forth. Rabbi Nachman says, um, Rabbi Nachman says, if it's, if it's from the living, then it's me. Cool, right? Anyways, Rashi says, that each one of them darshaned after their name. So it's an interesting idea. Which means, first of all, the very notion that we're discussing during the time of Golas who Mashiach is, means that it was, it was certain by, by the people that what? That Mashiach is someone amongst them. He's not some kind of a Mashiach, a Mary Poppins flying down from the sky with an umbrella, and here, and this is Mashiach. Mashiach is kind of a person amongst the people and, uh, and uh, re- comes to redeem the Jewish people. So you see that from here. The other thing, the Gemara tells a story right before over here, that Reb Shua ben Levi met, um, met, uh, met Elio and Navi, and he said, when is Mashiach coming? And he said, go ask Mashiach. So he goes, and he, goes, and, and he says, where is he? He says, he's sitting amongst the people that are outside of the fence gate of Rome. Amongst the poor people, save lay, those that are suffering at the gates of the, of the big city. So he goes there and he gives him a simon that he's someone who, everybody else, when they, re, re, when they put back, when they remove their bandages and rebandage, because they're, they're never suffering, they're terrible pains and all kinds of wounds, when they are, when they are removing their bandages, they all uh, remove all of them and then rebandage. But Mashiach, he takes one off and that's how you know which one he is. He puts one on, he only t- rebandages one band aid at a time. Why? Because just in case the time to redeem the Jewish people, he's, he wants to be immediately ready and, and excited to go redeem the Jewish people. So uh, anyways, he goes and he meets him and, and he told him, so he found, he identified who he was and he said, so what's going on? When are you coming? He said, today. And then he was so excited, but then when the day ended and he didn't come, he was puzzled and he asked Elio Anovi, what's going on? And he said, if you do tshuva, I'm ready to come today. 
But what do you see from this? You see from here, as the Rebbe says, in, in Tavshin Nun Aleph, in Asich, in Parshas Tazriya Metzayra, the Rebbe says over here, She Mashiach nimtza ba'olam bizman u b'makam ha'golos. Mashiach is present in the world when it says he's sitting amongst those that are wounded. Who are the people who are wounded? It means amongst the, his fellow Jews who are wounded from the pains, from the cuts and the bruises of exile. So he's, he's amongst them. He's not, I'm saying Mashiach is not someone that comes for out of nowhere that no one... He, and he's in a state of exile. That means he's not just amongst them in the Golos, but the Golos doesn't affect him. He is impacted by the Golos. He's, he, 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 he endures this, this, the pains of exile. And, and, and the Rebbe brings, like Rabbeinu HaKadosh. Why was Rabbeinu HaKadosh Rebbe identified as Mashiach? So, Vadaihainu Rabbeinu HaKadosh. So, 60, Rashi says, why? The soivel tachluim v'chasid gomer haya. First of all, he's a tremendous tzaddik. Obviously, we understand Mashiach has to be a tremendous tzaddik. But that he suffers, he has a very, very, he suffers a lot. So the fact that he was suffering was an indication. That means he's with the Jewish people in this suffering. And he concludes, the fact that you see that his bandage, he's only removing one bandage, means that he's waiting that he can't, with shortness of breath, and with and is and and, and 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 so so deep waiting so strongly for Mashiach to come, for him to be able to redeem the Jewish people. So, so another. By the way, this by the way points out another thing about these people that are the Mashiach, the the line of David, the lineage of David that goes through history, to empower the messianic development, the Mashiach in the world, the the, 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 the to, to move the world forward through a Mashiach. So you see from here that one of the things are that you have to see in them that they have a special interest in Moshiach. In other words, Moshiach is not, they're, since, they're, since their entire business and they carry, so to speak, Moshiach's neshama inside of them, so obviously Moshiach is on top of their minds. And they're always thinking about Moshiach, talking about Moshiach, and spreading a Moshiach consciousness throughout the Jew, through the Jewish people. Now, um, to further Ill, uh, emphasize this idea, the um, no, the Bartanura, one of the great commentaries on the Mishnah, the Bartanura in in his Pirush on Rus says as follows: Behold, Dor Vedor in every generation, Yeshnoi Echad Mizera Yehuda, there is a person from the descendants of Yehuda. Who he is fitting to be the Mashiach for the Jewish people. So you see clearly that, it, that, Mosh, that Mashiach is always there amongst the Jewish people. Then you have the Chassam Sofer in his Chuvis, Charles in the great Poskim. The Chassam Sofer says, From the day the Beis Amigdush was, was destroyed, Miyad immediately, Noilad Echod Bitzitkasoyliyaz Goyal. A person is born who, because of his righteousness, he's on a level that he could be the goel, but not necessarily that he will be the actual Mashiach, but he is possible. I guess the Chassam Soifer is building it on the Gemara, which says that the moment the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed, Mashiach was on the on the on the Jerusalem passage of the Jerusalem Talmud that a baby was born that could be the Mashiach. hazman when the time will arrive, Yigale Elav Hashem Hashem will reveal himself to him and he will send him. And the Chassam Seifer says, because of our sins, so many of them passed already. In other words, in every generation, there's someone who has that quality. But take a look, he says, our Achmanis, that such so much time has passed, and all these potential Mashiachs came and went. The Kvar Kama, the Kvar, the Kvar Mesu, and they died, but it, but it continues. They passed the baton on, so to speak. Someone is here continuously to be, that carries Mashiach's Neshama. Anyways, the Stechemed says, Ubederach now, the, based on, with, with this idea, the Stechemed, when great Sephardic uh, uh, Poisek and, 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 and um, great, great rabbi says, Bederach Hazem Meshuyer Etzlam, it was estimated by the people, Behold, Dor, he adds to the Chassam Seifer, not only is there someone, but the Stechemed says, in every generation, 
People had a sense of who that might be. Me, who, who he is. Ra- like Rebbe, Rabbeinu HaKadosh B'doyroi, they said upon him that he's the one that's ready. And Valpizek Kozvu Gam Kain Talmidei HaArizal, the students of the Ari said, Shebiyam of Hari. that in his days it was the Ari HaKadosh. Why? It made so much sense. Because the Arizal suddenly blasted the world with divine knowledge that was like unheard of before the Holy Ari. In such a short period of time, it was like, you can see that he was a God sent. He's like a whole different type of a tzaddik that was here illuminating the world. And therefore, his students identified him as Mashiach. And the Chetzdechemet says, This is so simple. This is, this is the way it is. So what do we have over here? Is that we have a Mashiach going through all the generations. We know certain things about the character of these, of these Mashiachim, which is really one Mashiach that makes it through the generations. They even had an estimation of who these people are. And it's interesting, we take a look, for instance, regarding Rabbeinu HaKadosh, who was, a, who was a descendant of David HaMelech, and he was an unparalleled leader who gained the respect not only of the Jewish people, but of the Gentile world as well. We know that the Roman emperor was his best friend. They were very close. And the Gemara tells stories about it. But we also find that Rabbeinu HaKadosh had a special connection to Malchus Beis David. There's a Gemara Masech this Shabbos where the Rebbe says that whoever said, that he goes and he gives a whole explanation that David HaMelech never sinned with Batsheva. He didn't sin with Batsheva. And Rebbe gives that example, gives, gives an explanation on it. So the Gemara says, yeah, because he's a grandson of David HaMelech, so he protects his grandfather. So you see from that, that the, already you see a connection that Rebbe identifies so deeply with David HaMelech. The Gemara says another instance, the Gemara says that in Masech Rosh Hashanah, that Rebbe um, instructed Reb Chia to go see about the new moon. And he gave him a sign. What's the sign of the new moon? He said, David Melech Yisrael Chai V'Kayam. David Melech Yisrael, the sign that he would that would be transmitted about whether you saw the moon or didn't see the moon, is David Melech Yisrael Chai V'Kayim. David, the king of Israel, lives forever. So the Marsha says, why did he do that, Simon? Because we know Malchus Beis David is compared to the moon. If you see a new moon, why is that an indication that Malchus Beis David, the renaissance, the coming back of Malchus Beis David? Another case you see about Rabbeinu HaKadosh. Came out one time that Tisha B'Av came out on Shabbos. Again, the Rabbeinu HaKadosh is living like a hundred years after the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. 70, 80 years, something like that. Tisha B'av came out on Shabbos and Rabbeinu HaKadosh wanted to do away with Tisha B'av. He didn't want, he said once it's pushed away you shouldn't have to pass on Sunday. So what's the deeper meaning why Rabbeinu HaKadosh said this year let's cancel Tisha B'av. Because we know when Mashiach will come Tisha B'av won't be a fast day, it will be a yontif. So those people who are, who their essence is Mashiach is, 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 is the great yomtev of the Giyula, the future. So they already are living in that reality. So they're, they're pushing. So you, see, you see in them that they push in that direction. That's what they stand for. The other thing that Rebbeinu HaKadosh did, which is really, really the, the, the underpinnings for Mashiach, is Rebbeinu HaKadosh was the first one to gather Torah Shavol Peh and give it to us in a book. He gave us the Mishnayis. And the Gemara says, Eina Goliath Meskansis Elobis Chosa Mishnayis. The Golis will not be the Goliois, the gathering of the exile, will only come through the, through the Mishnayis. And the reason, just simply on that, that is, how do the Jewish people fix the world, the entire world, through applying the Torah observance, through studying the Torah, and applying Torah observance? But if the Torah is all scattered in a bunch of places, and you don't have a clear understanding of, the, of, of what, the rule, what the Torah, the, 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 the essential structure of Torah is, then, 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 then um, first of all, li- that translates into a certain scattering in all of creation. If the Torah is scattered, then Torah is the soul of creation, it's the blueprint of creation, then obviously the, the world remains a scattered world, and that's what Golos is. Golos is a scattered existence. Moshiach is when everything comes together in harmony. When you can look back at the, first of all, you can look at the entire world and see how every single part of the world is part of one perfect whole. And we can look at all of history from the beginning of time to the end of time and see how everything is like a symphony. Everything comes together perfectly. 
For that to happen, there first needs to be a gathering of the Torah as well into a certain structure. Plus, once the Jewish people have the Mishnayis, it makes it accessible for everybody to study Torah and study the entire Torah, which causes a certain purification in the world just by studying it. So these are all reasons why Rabbeinu HaKadosh Dafke does it, because since he's Malchus based David, and what's the idea of Malchus based David? They have to be Masake in the world, Masake in Olam to create the whole world. Rabbeinu HaKadosh makes his Mashiach contribution in his generation. Now fast forward close to a thousand years. We come to the beginning of the, the sixth millennium, Friday. This is the crucial time. Because we spoke a little later that the decree of Gullus was primarily a thousand years. I brought you a lot of sources for that. So when you come to the beginning of Friday, Friday morning, which comes out, not so Friday morning, Thursday night, it's the beginning of Friday. You flip from Elif HaChamishi to Elif HaShishi. So at that time is the time of, it in, in, in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the secular calendar, it's the year 1240. So, what happens in the year 1240? So, before we get to what happens in the year 1240, we see the Ramban, the Ramban Nachmanidi says that a lot of the switches that happened from one millennium to the next millennium took place, Bein Hashmashes, already as it's getting twilight at the end of the previous millennium, as we're moving into the next millennia, there is, a, there is already a switch. You can see already the change. For example, Avram Avinu was born 48 years before the beginning of the third millennium. So the changes don't happen exactly then. They happen around that time. And particularly a period of time before that. For example, the, second, the destruction of the second Beis Amigdash, which is really belongs to the fourth millennium, the dark, the, the, to belongs to the fifth millennium, the dark period that we spoke about last week, the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash had a, happened 172 years earlier. So you see that as you're getting into that zone. So a very, very important figure is Rabbeinu Moshe ben Maimon the Rambam. Incredible figure. And in him you see the qualities, and the Chazal, that's why it was said about him, in Moshe, Ad Moshe, Leikom Ke Moshe. From Moshe to Moshe, there was no one that stood like Moshe. In a sense, his name is Moshe, and he lived in Mitzrayim. And in this week's parsha, parsha's boy, we say, Laman revois mofsai be'eretz Mitzrayim, I will increase my wonders in the land of Mitzrayim. And we know that all the exiles, the, Gemara, the Medrash says, Al Shem Mitzrayim, they're called in the name of Mitzrayim. So the essence of all exiles is Golos Mitzrayim. Who takes the Jewish people out of Golos Mitzrayim? Moshe Rabbeinu. So the words, Laman revois mofsai be'eretz Mitzrayim, it says, from early Svarim, is Rosh Tevis Rambam. And here's where the Rambam is hinted to in the Torah. That means he's the one who increases the miracles in the time of Golas. He paves the way for Mashiach. So let's take a look at Rambam. Let's see what the Rambam has given for the Jewish people. First of all, the Rambam gave us the Mishnah Torah. Which the Mishnah Torah is, again, if the Mishnayis was gathering the Torah in one place, but it wasn't yet ready for halachic observance. You can't pass in for Mishnah. The Rambam actually gave you a sefer of halacha of the entire Torah. He's Maccabit. He gathers all. First of all, you see, he's doing something that is changing Judaism. That is, that is, that is kind of, first of all, it's fortifying the Jewish people. Based on the Rambam comes later the Shulchan Aruch. Our entire Jewish observance, both for Ashkenazim and Sephardim, is all, is all in a sense, manadian. Okay, if I want to use a fancy word. It's, 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 it's leaning on the Rambam. In the sense that the Rambam gave us a book, Makabit's Kola Kula. And it's interesting, the reason the Rambam says I've done it is because I see that the exile is so strong and it's impacting, and we don't have any more the ability to be able to, every person to be able to study deep the, all the different passages in the Talmud in order to come to halachic. Uh, uh, so, in order to fight the effect of the exile. So, again, what's Moshiach? He counters the Golas. So therefore, he's going to do this unbelievable contribution and give the Jewish people a book of Rambam, a Sefer of Rambam. But there's another thing. The Rambam in his Sefer says, when he discusses Mashiach, what is Mashiach's avod? He says, the Yaakov Kol Yisrael, he has to influence, compel the Jewish people to follow Torah and mitzvahs. In a sense, the book of Rambam is the Yaakov Kol Yisrael. Because without the book of Rambam, you have no compelling force to make you keep mitzvahs because you don't really have one source that gives you complete observance. Now, I know we can't pass in today based on Rambam. 
because there are later Achronim, but, but still the Rambam was the first codifier in such a magnificent, all encompassing the entire Torah. So the idea of a Yaakov Kol Yisrael, of influencing the Jewish people in observance, the Rambam is the seeds for Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch is what makes, what does a Jew do when he wants to know how to behave, how to do anything in business life, in family life, with his education, with children, with, 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 in every aspect of life, where, where do you consult? You consult Shulchan Aruch. And, and what's Shulchan Aruch based? On Rambam. So this idea, so you see that when we say Moshiach will, will influence all the Jewish people to keep mitzvahs, it's not just Moshiach himself who actually does that in the literal. It's a conceptual thing. It's, it's, it's a process. The Rambam's contribution of giving us Mishneh Torah is messianic. That's what people don't realize. It is messianic. It's a Moshiach entity. The other thing about Rambam is that in his Mishneh Torah, two things. He is the first person who clarifies to us the mitzvah of knowing Hashem. Studying about God, knowing God. And he writes his first few about the mitzvah of... of uh, and he gives you general ideas of Yediya Hashem, what does it mean to know Hashem, as a book of halacha. Well, what's Mashiach? Mashiach will be a time when we will fulfill the mitzvah of knowing God in the, in the, in the highest way. And you have right at the beginning of the Sefer Rambam, you have a whole discussion on the mitzvah of Yediya Hashem. And then the other thing, what else does Rambam give us? In the end of his book, he gives us the laws of Mashiach. And he gives us all the halacha regarding of how Mashiach is identified. We have no other book that does that besides Rambam. So again, you see Rambam's contribution in, in, in fortifying and in bringing, in bringing... Now another thing. The Rambam writes a sefer to the Jews in Yemen. And the Rambam encourages them about Bias HaMashiach in the most unbelievable way. His whole sefer, his whole letter to them, he soothes them. He tells them how Mashiach is coming very soon. And even though you're going through tremendous darkness, don't be afraid, Hashem. And he explains, he explains, and more than that, the Ramam goes ahead, as I said earlier, Mashiach is a time when you can basically, when everything makes sense, when you take a look at all of history and everything comes together and you realize that there is a magnificent ruler and creator who created everything and designed it all. Ramam is the first one to say such a novel idea that Christianity and Islam both of them came to the world to prepare the world for Mashiach, to bring to the Gentiles messianic concept and an awareness of God and for people to leave go of paganism and to believe in one Hashem. So the Rambam is the one who sees in the entire, in the entire unfolding of, of history and even in the most darkest things that there were, the persecutions, the Rambam sees Mashiach in all of this. These are all indications of how Mashiach the Rambam is. When did the Rambam live? The Rambam passed away 36 years, I think it's in the year 1206. In the year 1206, the Rambam passed away, which is 36, 34 years before, before 1240, before the beginning of the... Of the, uh, of, the, of the sixth millennium of El So you see that there was this, a tremendous hachan, was a tr there was a great leaping forward towards the Giyula in, 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 in Rambam. Now, the next figure who is so, so important in the unfolding of Mashiach is in Ramosha ben Nachman, Nachmanides. Nachmanides actually is... Um, born, I'm not exactly sure, I looked it up yesterday, I forgot. As you see, I don't write notes, so I don't remember exact date. But the, Ram, the Ramban, Nachmanides, was actually fully active in the year 1240, during those years. That's his period, that's his era. And uh, we know that the Ramban was an awesome Kabbalist. And the Ramban lended tremendous legitimacy to the whole idea of Panimia Satoru. And that there was an esoteric, because there was always amongst the Jewish people, people that had a hard time with Jewish mysticism. The Ramban is the first person to make a purish on the Torah that's based on pshat, remez, drush, and sod, secrets. And he calls it al derecha emes. So you see, the fact, so many people would have absolutely zero connection to mysticism, 
So many average Jews would have zero connection to mysticism unless they go to the yeshiva of Mikubalim. Or today's days, they learn Hasidus. And you get Panini Asatorah. But how does a regular Ben Torah, a regular Jew who's yeah, not interested in that, get a connection to Pneumia Satara? Well, he, one thing that everybody, everybody does is learn Rashi, and if you're a little bit of a scholar, you want to learn Pirush Ramban ala Torah. You can't help it unless you're going to skip in almost every piece, you're going to skip the end. The Ramban is always adding in al derecha em, I'm saying every piece, but many of his pieces, derecha emes. So obviously at least he's creating curiosity in the one that's learning that there is a deeper reality, there's a deeper truth of him. But it goes much deeper than that. Nachmanides is the one <clears throat> who argues on Rambam, and he's the one who kind of gives us an, an understanding of the ultimate destiny of the world. According to Nachmanides, and all the Mekubalim follow, most of the Kubalim follow what Nachmanides teaches, and that is that the ultimate destination of creation is not a spiritual existence where Nisham is existing on Eden, but that souls have to be contained within bodies here in this world, and the ultimate purpose, which is basically the foundation of the idea that the ultimate purpose that Hashem has is a dwelling place in this lower world. Because if the ultimate experience is an abstract knowledge of the divine that happens in the, in the higher spheres above, then why would we be stuck down here in physical bodies for all eternity when the party is taking place up there? It wouldn't make any sense. So Nachmanides idea that Olam Haba, I don't want to get into this whole discussion, is souls down here and that the Nishama Singan Eden is only a temporary place, but ultimately Tchias HaMesim, the resurrection, is the ultimate station and that's the ultimate reward, is tremendously messianic. And uh, so many, and, and, and many other concepts of the Ramban. But you see, when did the Ramban live? Mamish at the turn, when in the year 1240. Now let's take it. What? Oh, so he dies in 1270, and when was he born? Yeah. All right. Um, he also goes up to Eretz Yisrael. He's the one who builds the oldest shul we have in the old city. Is the, is the, is the Ramban's shul? And probably was destroyed, rebuilt, but whatever. Is the Ramban's 1194. So, Mamish, the Ramban is born six years before the beginning of, no, no, 1194, no, that's, that's, that's the beginning of 12. It's about, it's about 45 years before the, before, before the, set, almost, mamish the same like Avram Avinu. 48 years, he's 45 years before the beginning of Elif Hashishi. That's really interesting, what? Um, could be, no. The Rambam, yeah, no, the Rambam was of the opinion that the ultimate state of, of is, is, yeah, is Olam Haba is a, is, a, is, a, is a spiritual existence. So that's, you see, a, a leap towards, a, a, and something that later became the more prevalent understanding of all the Jew, of, 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 in Judaism, is that Tchias HaMesim is the final goal, which is a huge messianic, um, it, it's not just an idea, what I'm saying is, it's fundamental to appreciating the whole essence of Mashiach. Oh, by the way, I want to go back a minute to the Rambam, which I think is a very important idea. Another incredible idea, the seeds of Tikkun Olam, the first seeds of that is Rambam. Because the Rambam is the person who puts into his halachas that we have an obligation as Jews to influence the non-Jews to keep seven mitzvahs b'nei noach. Which is, you don't find it in any other sifra halacha the Rambam, the Rambam is the one who puts that in, an obligation, that more, which is the seed of the idea that Jewish people need to influence all of humanity, which is what Mashiach has to do. Yisakein, Yisakein Nasa Olam, to serve Hashem. So you see that, that in Rambam. But we're going back to Rambam. Okay. This has happened all at the beginning of Elef Hashishi, at the beginning of the year 1240s. We said, oh, another interesting thing that happened then. It's exactly at that period that the book of Zohar, hear this amazing thing, it's exactly at that period that the book of Zohar makes its debut, which means it's discovered in the world, it's revealed. Until that time, Zohar was hidden. There was manuscripts that were passed down, they were hidden from, 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 from the masses. At that time, it was revealed. I looked up the year 1240 yesterday, and, uh, and what I found was Moshe de Leon, who is the one who actually 
through him this, the book of Zohar came out and was revealed is born in the year 1240. So at that mamish at that time is where is where is where and I know there is there is there is what's it called again those that question the authority of the Zohar but it's such a ridiculous thing um, anybody that has a little amuna anybody that has a little bit of faith that knows throughout history the reverence that all Gedoli Yisrael had to the Sefer Zohar and how this actually saved the Jewish people in the Golas um, realize that this is absolute shtus. In any case, but he was born in the year 1240, so it's at Mamash at that time. So within the exactly which year it was, but ha- the book of Zar, which is the foundation, most fundamental book on Pneumia Satorah, on the inner teachings of the Torah, is revealed during that time. Now the interesting thing is, in the book of Zar itself, I want to show you just a few quotes, where it says that part of the coming of Mashiach is the revelation of Pneumia Satorah of the innermost of the Torah, the teachings of the... So here's where it says like this. In Zohar Parshas Vayera it says, Amalei Reb Shimon, Reb Shimon says, Reb Shimon Bayechoi, Les re'usu de kutsha berichu bedadi yizkala kol kach la'alma. It's not God's will that these secrets should be revealed in the world. It's not God's will. God doesn't want to reveal it. The yei karev li'oyim in Meshicha, but when it will become, this is a Zohar in, in Parshas Vayera, when it will be close to the days of Mashiach, then alma, even little children, youngsters, zeminin la'ashkacha tmirin dechachmasa, are going to know the deepest secrets. The deepest secrets that in earlier generations no one knows. Young children, teenagers. I'll say an interesting thing. A Chabad girl who goes to... Uh, who takes her, serious, her study seriously and goes to a good Chabad seminary and learns and studies and learns Chassidus, knows more in Pnimi Yisatora than average rabbis knew a, a thousand years ago. I'm not talking about the mystics, but average rabbis that were, that, no, they didn't know. These things were hidden. And young, I'm not even talking about Bachrim who sit and really learn deeply what we call Samach Vav, these, these, these deep. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just, the Zohar says that. It's, it's, it's a prophecy from the Zohar. Ulamindabe Bey Kitsin the and they're going to know all kinds of dates and Chushbainas that we're doing right now. We're, we're all amateurs. <laughs> the fact that we can talk about this, such amazing secrets. Ubahi Zimna, and at that time, is Gal Yolachoyla. It will be revealed to everybody. Then there is another passage over here in the Zohar again. This is in Bamidbar, just to show you. The Zohar says like this, particularly to the idea that the book of Zohar will be revealed. Those that are wise will understand from the side of Bina, which is the tree of life. It's a Pasuk in Daniel. And those that are wise will shine with like the, like the brightness of the sky. Baha'i chibur edalach. And with this chibur, your chibur, which is what? The chibur of, um, of, of Reb Shimon Ba Yochai. This is what they notified Reb Shimon Ba Yochai. With your chibur, with your book, what you authored. The Iu Sefer Azoya, which is the book of Zoyar, Mizahara de Eme Law Tshuva, which comes... Anyways, begin the seed in Yisrael lamitam elana dechaya because the Jewish people are eventually going to taste from the tree of life, which is the book of Zohar, the Yohai Sefer Azor, which is the book of Zohar. Yapkin be min galuso berachame. They're going to go out of galus in, in, with, 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 with berachame. So it says clearly stated over here that pnimius Torah, the inner light of the Torah, is a preparation for the coming of Mashiach. And again, when did the Zohar become? known to the world, the Zohar became known to the world exactly at the turn of the millennium, from Elif HaChamishi to Elif HaShishi, as a preparation for the world for Mashiach. Now fast forward. The Gemara says in Masech Tzbarachas that the night has three parts to it. Shloishem Mishmaros, the night has three parts. The first third of the night, dogs are barking. The second third of the night, Donkeys are braying, and the third third of the night, um, two things. A woman talks to her husband, and 
and the tinik yainik mishtei imai, the child nurses from his mother. The Gemara Masechtas Brachas, the beginning, I think Davav is something. The Talmud and Gemara Masechtas Brachas, three parts to the night. The fifth Chabad Rebbe, in a discourse, Tafrei Shamach Kimmel, mentions an interesting thing. It's a discourse attributed to the Rebbe Roshal. That's what it says actually in the back. He talks about Lahav and Inyan HaBal to understand the concept of the Bal Shem Tov. And he explains a fascinating thing. He says what Chazal are talking about is the last night of exile, which is Thursday night. Thursday night, which means from the year 1240 to the year 1740. This is the last period of darkness. And Chazal say that this night is divided into three parts. The third part of the night, a, mother, a, a woman talks to her husband. Rashi says, why? Because um, it's getting morning already and it's getting closer to morning and people are waking up already. Today's days we go to sleep very late. Why? Because we have, we can, we can, we busy ourselves till very late. But <laughs> then there was no lights and there was no electronics and there was nothing to do. It became dark at 6 or 4.30, 5. By 7 o'clock everybody was sleeping already, right? So by 3 o'clock in the morning, everybody was already up. So husband talks to their wife because we're already waking up. And a mother is, is nursing. I and mean, the mother nurses, the baby nurses from the mother because the baby wakes up hungry. So the baby's nurse. So he says like this. He says, the last third of the night, if you take a night and you divide it into three parts, you take 500 years, which is night period. As we spoke last week, 500 years is night, 500 years is day. So if you take 500 years and you divide it into three parts, it's 166 each part. Two times 166 is 333. So you have to go into 333 years into Elef Hashish, into Elef Hashish, you have the night of Elef Hashish. So if you do from the year 1240, 333 years, you get to the year 1573. 1573, what's going on? The most incredible, if, you, if you're asking the question, where do you see God in the world? Where do you see that this calendar that I've spoken about last week is on perfect, it's, it's on target exactly the way it needs? In the city of Tzvas, you have first of all the most incredible group of tzaddikim that you've ever, like, like we've ever known live together. You have the rabbi, he's the one who made the Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosef Karay, and you have the, 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 the darshan is Ramosh Alshech, the one who gives us that you have the, and then you have the, the Rebbe, so to speak, was the big Makubal, is the Arizal. And the Arizal was only revealed for two years. And his, his, his years that he was, that he was re, re, revealed is the year seven, is two years before to the year 17, to the year 1573. In other words, he concludes his contribution in Shnas Sheleg, Shin Lamed Gimel. Actually, Sheleg means snow, which represents a certain whitening, Kisheleg Yalbinu, in the Elvish. Now, we know that the Arizal caused the world to leap tremendously uh, forward in terms of knowledge of Pnimi Satora. After the Arizal, the teachings of Kabbalah spread like wildfire across the Jewish, Jewish people. If at the beginning there was some control over it, after the Arizal, like kind of lost all control. People were studying Kabbalah everywhere. The ideas of mysticism started spreading like crazy. And the, 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 the fifth Chabad Rebbe says, the meaning of that is, the Jewish baby, the baby that the Gemara is talking about, the baby that the Talmud is talking about is the Jewish people who are hungry because we haven't been fed with godly revelation for over 1,300 years or 1,200 years. We're starving. At the time of the Beis Amigdash, we had some, we were, we were nurtured, but our soul is starving for light and we need a little bit. So we wake up and we're crying and our mommy has nurse, mercy on us, and that's the mother is the Shekhinah. And she starts nursing her for her milk. Her milk is the light, the deep teachings of, 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 of mysticism, of the Arizal. And that happens exactly at that time. And what does the Arizal tell us? So the Arizal tells us that that, even though we said earlier from the Zohar, that what? That in the end of days, the secrets will be revealed. And I told you that in the beginning of the Elevate, the book of Zohar was revealed, but it was still, even though it was revealed, but it was not studied 
and, and, and appreciated around because very few still studied Kabbalah. Came the Arizal, and the Arizal says in many places that in his days, mitzvah legalo is It's a mitzvah to reveal these teachings. And the Arizal goes ahead and, and says, his student Reb Chaim Vital, in his Shar Hakdamas, he says like this, Vagolus Achrin Hamar Vaorach Hashar Anu Bavenu Senu Arabim, this long exile that we're in right now. Adi Yisuvim b'nei Yisrael b'ti Yufta until Yidna will do tshuva. He says, what's the tshuva of the Jewish people? What's tshuva? Tshuva is not repenting just, you know, feeling that you're bad about yourself. Tshuva means you're turning to God. You want to know Hashem again. You're thirsting for Hashem. Ibiksu, ibiksu es Hashem elokehem. They're going to search to know Hashem. Lahakiroi, to know Hashem. Uliyoidoi, and to be familiar with Him. And how do you get to know God? Beraze Torah with the secrets of Torah. Ki al yodam teskarev ha It's through these secrets the Geula will come. U kviyachol Yeshua sal the shechinas uzay. The redemption of the shechina is dependent on what? On the people be getting to learn and to study and to know the deeper teachings of the Torah. And he, ki hakol. These are the words of Rab Chaim Vital. Ki hakol talu beese kachachma azois. Everything is dependent in in the this learning these, these teachings. And the fact that we do not, people who do not allow it to be studied, who don't want to study it, this is what's holding back the building of the third Beis HaMikdash. And he, I'm just quoting a little part, he goes on and on and on. The, the great Makubal Reb Avram Azulai, in his, in his Agdama to say for Eirachama, he says, Matsasi Kosev I found written, Kimasha Nigzar Lamaila, this that was written, that was decreed above, Shaloyis Asku Bachachmasa Emes, that this has to be a secret, that people should not be involved with it, Begoloi, Adman Kotsev, until when? Atashlam Shnas Haran, till the conclusion of the year 250. Hey, Alafim 250. So that's 17, that's um, 1240 plus 200, 1440 plus 50, 1490. Oh, right at the time of the Spanish Inquisition. It's right at that time, till then there was a Gezerah. But after that, he says, Mikam ve'elach, yikra dara basra, it's called already the last generation, v'hutra ha he's, he's, he's connecting it not to the last third of the night, but midway, chatzois. You realize that? He's connecting it, he's connecting it to chatzois, midnight. Midnight of that night is when and Umashnas Tov Shin, and then 50 years later from the year Hey Shin Liyatsira, Mitzvim and Amufchar, Sheyis Asku Berabim, that everybody should learn it in public. Gedoyle Muktanim, older and younger. Anyways. Va'achar Shebizchuze Osid Lavoi Melecha Moshiach, in this merit King Moshiach will come. Veloi Bizchus Acher, and not with any other Zchus, Ein Ro'ilis Rashel. It's not fitting that we should that we should be lax in this. The Shlah HaKadosh, same thing. But it's not just something that you will take from people that are known to be mystics. Let's take a look at the Vilna Goyen. There's a Sefer Evan Shloima uh, uh, and a Perikud Al of Piske Gimel. Ha-Geula Hazois, the words of the Vilna Goyen. This Geula, Loitia Raka Yedei Limuda Torah, will only come about through Torah study. The Iker Hagula and the main redemption, Talia is dependent, Belimud Hakabala, in learning of mysticism. That's from the Vilna Gaon. And I'm just one tiny quote from the Vilna Gaon. There's a lot from the Vilna Gaon where he's, where he's demanding the study of Panimia Satora as a preparation for Mashiach. Anyways, because the Yetzirah, there will always be, even if. Uh, And as I told you, it's really, really, really dependent. It's, this is all based on what it says explicitly in Zohar, where it says very, very strongly how everything is dependent on, um, the, on, on learning of Torah. But then the Zohar says an interesting thing. The Zohar actually says over here, in Tikkun HaZohar, Tikkun Vav, the Kama B'nai Nasha Letata, that in the end of days, many people down here below, Yisparnesin, Mahai Chibur Adaloch, they're gonna get their nourishment, their nutrition, 
from this from the book of Zohar, from this mystical teachings. Kad yizgalil atato, when it's going to be revealed below, bedara basra, in the last generation, besoif yamaya, on the end of days. So we'll understand that the Zohar is actually adding something more over here. It's not enough to study it and to know about it. You have to learn it so well that it actually starts becoming you. It gives you parnasa, it becomes part of you. Which Mepharshim explain, it means not just a knowledge of Kabbalah, but it means to actually crack the code of Kabbalah and to truly appreciate what these teachings really mean. What do they really mean? So we're going to see soon. So now, so this is what happened during that time. I, I mentioned before, a woman starts te- talking to her husband. So the, the, the way the uh, fifth Chabad Rebbe says, what that means is, the woman is the Shechina. The husband is a Kaddish Baruch Hu, a mystical idea. And during the time of Golos, the Shechina is banished, which means the divine presence that's with us is banished from her husband. It's like we say a Shalom Bayis dispute. God sends the Jewish people out together with the Shechina, whatever that means. But as we're getting closer to Mashiach, they start communicating again. And that's why you have such an influx of godliness to the world. The Arizal actually says that in his times, the real harsh gezeris of Golis are over, and from now on, are going to start neshamis of tikkun, they're going to start coming to the world. Rectified souls. So who are these souls that we're talking about, these rectified souls? So for that we wait to the next period. And as I mentioned to you earlier, the period of the morning of, of Friday. What's the morning of Friday? The morning of Friday is the year 1740. And again you see the most unbelievable thing that happens in Jewelry. And that is that we were talking about the darkest of times. The Jewish people have been already close to 1,500 years in exile. Battered and broken, shattered. They're so crushed. It looks like they will never, ever, ever be able to pull out of this. But we know what the morale says. The secret of the Giyula is that it's like cold. It's compared a lot of times to a planting. You plant a seed, and when it rots, and it reaches the full rotting and it decays completely, it's exactly then when it starts growing. If you can say there was ever a period of time that Judaism was at the point of completely dissolving and rotting, it was right, the time period right before the Baal Shem Tov. We had a tremendous um, emotional, psychological breakdown because of Shabzai Tzvi. In addition to that, we had the, the Chamelenitsky programs which massacred untold amount of Jews that were killed and, 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 and communi- what it did mainly, what was so bad about it was it uprooted communities. It scattered the Jewish communities. And people moved, in, moved out of the cities. They moved into little towns and villages and they didn't have an infrastructure. They, didn't have, they were impoverished. They didn't have money to teach their children Torah. And there was a tremendous, and there were scholars, but they were just selected few. They didn't take interest in the ignorant people and the ignorant people were shunned and pushed away. They were downtrodden. And had not the holy Baal Shem Tov arrived that, just at that moment in history, there would have been a devastation in the Jewish community that we would have been lost. The Jewish people would have been lost. And it was at that crucial moment of history that the powerful Nisham of Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, which is written all over, that what? That his Nisham and the tremendous revolution that he brought is the beginning of the light of Mashiach. It's the beginning of the uh, his galos of Mashiach in the world. I really, really want, um, would love to discuss this at length, but I don't want to go over time. So what we're going to do is, in the next class, I'm going to um, continue, uh, at least for about a quarter of the next class, the, the, the completion of this idea before we begin the next and to discuss this tremendous Moshiach presence both two things in terms of the knowledge of God and the connection of Jews in their deepest way of serving Hashem in a new way that we haven't seen before a way that it involves tremendous joy, happiness which is all geula. think about it 
song, dance, and muna, and the Mashiach, and, and the Baal Shem to put a tremendous resurgence of the muna in the Mashiach, and so on and so forth. We're going to see how that works, and how that evolves from the Baal Shem to the onward. And another thing we're going to see is the character of a king revealed in the Baal Shem Tov and in his students. In other words, the idea that there is someone driving the Giyula, someone who has the exhibits, the, 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 the elements of Malchus, of kingship, also kind of takes on a whole new meaning when the Hizgalos of the Tzadikim, from the descendants of the Baal Shem Tov, which if you know that the coin, we say, when, when a Hasidic Rebbe, for the first time in history, was called an Adumur. An Adumur. What does Adumur mean? It's a, it's a, it's a acronym for the word Adonenu, Moireinu, Verabenu. So I understand Moireinu, Verabenu, our teacher, our leader. But what's Adonenu? Adonenu means our master. You don't see that applied throughout history. I mean, they didn't call the Rambam Adumur. It was a Hasidic thing related to the Baal Shem Tov. And the reason is, because the Baal Shem Tov and his students, they, because we're coming already to Friday morning, so this vague and mysterious being of the Moshiach of the generation that has till now been kind of very, very, very hidden, starts to become more of an identifiable being that we can see and point our finger on. And people sense in him that he has elements of malchus and kingship, as we're going to see, as we're going to discuss next week, the latter part of the sixth millennium, up to where we're standing today. So Be'ez Hashem joins. Oh, that's a very important announcement. The class next week, I, I, in the, on the... Um, on the announcement, it says it will be 10.15 in the morning, because I had a, a, something important that I, I needed to go do, to, I mean, that I had to speak by. But I'm making a change in it. Instead of it being 10.15 next week, from 10.15 till 11.30, we're gonna, just for next week, change it to Sunday evening at eight o'clock, okay? So next week's class is not gonna be Sunday morning, it's gonna be Sunday evening, eight o'clock. Please join us for the next class. Thank you.